I could talk for hours. I'm not sure whether we want to take a couple questions if you've got any about the Kennedy Space Center or about flying in space or any of those kind of Yes? It's kind of a silly question, but is, do, you, do you believe in any other life out there? Ever see anything? Such as aliens? Well, yeah. <laughs> The only aliens I've seen are here on Earth. Uh, I, you know, I'm a, in, uh, I've known a lot of people in the space program and over the years, and some great scientists, great astronomers. And I've, uh, you know, I think that there's a possibility since there's billions of stars and galaxies that uh, there could be a local inhabitant of a planet out there somewhere, standing before the other inhabitants of their planet. Tell him what a great, exciting adventure it was to circle it. It could be going to place somewhere in this universe of ours. So I don't discount it. I've never seen it. I've flown more than 8,000 hours and 40 or 50 types of airplanes. I like to brag I've flown everything from the Goodyear blimp to the space shuttle. <laughs> and everything in between. A lot of World War I and World War II airplanes, and all the big commercial airplanes. So, But I, in all those hours of flying, I've never seen anything that I could not physically explain. But I will never say it's not possible. Yes, sir? You've obviously um, <coughs> experienced and seen much more than any of us here. So what would be your binding memory? Of, of, of what site or what experience could you crystallize? Obviously, the, the whole experience of being in they asked that same thing to Scott Carpenter, one of our first a great friend of mine, the first seven Mercury guys. What was the best part of the mission, Scott? And he said, gosh. I think from takeoff to landing, <laughs> that's kind of the way you approach it, but obviously there are highlights, beautiful parts of the earth that you see. My favorite part was the Kamchatka Peninsula of Russia, because we were flying over at night, and it was all these 20 or 30 active volcanoes that looked like the 4th of July, so it was beautiful. And all the beautiful islands, the Seychelles and the Hawaiian Islands were beautiful, and all the mountain ranges. But my fondest memory, I think, was 45 minutes after launch, we were on the other side of the earth. 45 minutes away. It takes us an hour and a half to go around, so we were on the opposite side. And my first job as a pilot, after we secure all the, do our on orbit activities, we call it, shut down everything up front and get ready to move to the back. And after we were ready to do this, I unbuckled my seatbelt, and guess what? It's not like in a simulator where I've had to get up and walk back to the back. This time when I unstrapped, I pushed on the seat and I floated up. Did kind of, kind of a somersault backward and set myself up back here. Went through the procedures. My job as a pilot is to set up the computers in the back and then hit the button that starts the payload bay doors open. And I was never ready for what I saw. But it's, uh, it was the most moving experience I think I've ever had. As soon as I hit the button, the doors cracked. Six inches, eight inches. Get out to about three feet. And for the first time in my life, I'd seen the Earth from space. And we were right over the middle of the outback in Australia. And I could look west and see Perth, look east and see Sydney, the whole continent. And I kept saying, God, thank you for this opportunity. And it just got better. The whole rest of the mission got better. So just a wonderful experience. Yes, sir? What motivated you? What? What motivated me? The guys like Scott Carpenter and Wally Sherrod, John Glenn, all the guys that I got to know after I got to NASA. So it was a wonderful experience for me just to witness the early stages of our program. Of course, when I grew up, when I was born and grew up, we didn't have astronauts like you do. I had Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. Do you remember those anybody? <laughs> so when we started selecting astronauts and cosmonauts and flying spacecraft, it got my attention and I wanted to be one of those guys. So when I got in the Navy, kind of did what Alan Shepard did. I read his biography. Did what Wally Sherrod did, Scott Carpenter, and voila, as they say in France, I got to come down and get my time and fly space shuttle. So I was really lucky to get to do that. Yes? Do you necessarily need to be a Navy pilot? You've mentioned all of these gentlemen. Do you, is that, would that be the track? It's not necessary to be a Navy pilot, but that's where the best ones come from. <laughs> Back in the early days of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, everybody were pilots. And they all came from the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Air Force. So kind of evenly divided. When we picked our first class of shuttle people, me and the other 34, there were 15 pilots, just like before. We had to have people to fly the spacecraft. And 10 of us were Navy and five were Air Force. 
the other twenty people like sally ride and guy blue for our first african american to find space for all mission specialists it's still my job to fly the spacecraft up fly it around monitor all the systems and come back and make the landing it's sally and guy and the other medical doctors and astronomers physicists you know all the physicists it's their job to do the research and development uh, do all the technological stuff launch the satellites do the spacewalks for some reason nasa wants the pilots to stay inside <laughs> so they get to have all the fun i call it so we monitor the ship and bring it back and land it all the mission specials do all the science so that means that roughly two out of every seven crew members are military because all the pilots still come from the military but the other five normally are civilians that are flying the space program so that's kind of the ratio of military versus civilians these days. The last class, by the way, we just picked nine astronauts. I think there were two military people in that nine. Yes, sir. So when you're sitting there on the launch pad, the very first time you went into space, when it started taking off, what were you thinking? What was I thinking? I better do my job. <laughs> I better not mess up. I got a job to do here. So you're and that's by design. When we go out the launch pad and go through these countdown procedures, the pilots are so busy. We got two of us. We're so busy with the final countdown that <laughs> comes and goes. Only eight and a half minutes from the launch pad to being in space. And it's very high intensity activities going on. So you really don't have time to think about what's just about to happen. And, and we're aided by the fact that for the year and a half before, or a year or so, we've been training in Houston, Texas. And our simulators over there are so realistic that you can't tell the difference between flying simulators and flying space shuttles, just like the shuttle launch experience. So we've gone through many hundreds of hours of preparation in Houston, and that's much more, I call it much more rigorous than flying the real space shuttle, because in Houston, Texas, when we're in our simulators, we lift off, we do lift off the floor over there and fly up for about 50 feet, get to rock and roll and then the music and the noise, and uh, so it's just as factual or realistic as flying the real shuttle. Big difference in Houston is, as soon as you lift off, alarms, bells, whistles, engines failing, hydraulic systems, electrical systems, pressurization, loss of control, you name it, for the whole eight and a half minutes. When you come out of a four hour simulator in Houston with your flight suit soaking wet. If you like it, been clubbing you over the head with a bat. And that's the way it is over there for a year, and that's good. Because it prepares you and your crew to come down here and handle just about anything that pops up. Sad part about the Challenger and Columbia, of course, is <clears throat> they didn't have any control over their destiny, sadly. They were as highly trained as anybody else, but they couldn't have done anything about their situations had they known them. I was just wondering, when you go to take off with your pilots, are you piloting or is it like not the, the launches are computer controlled. Uh, we've got five computers on board that 